Hello, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you to another episode of the podcast for Without Spot or Blemish Ministry. Really glad you're here today. And today we're going to discuss a reason many Christian wives are miserable, and by extension, a reason for many divorces. But before we begin, let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we praise you and thank you for today. We thank you for this moment that we can come before you with a problem that is vexing not only society, but the, what calls itself the church. Divorce rates are over 50%. Separation rates are, are astronomical. Hardly any of the relationships that I see uh, that are defined as Christian are living themselves out in a way that seems like there's peace and harmony. And so, Father, I'm asking you to help us get to the bottom of it in this um, episode. And I'm asking you to just show us the truth from your word in a way that is comes with humility, but with truth, Father, that we wouldn't skirt the truth or try to sidestep it, that we would seek the truth at all costs. I pray that not only for myself, but each and every listener that's uh, come today to hear this podcast. So we can get to the bottom of this and bring peace back to our families, at least among those of us who are able to serve you and receive it, Father. I pray that for each and every listener. I bind up rebuke every demonic spirit of disunity operating in the marriages or families of any person listening. I come against the narcissistic or the Jezebel spirit operating against anyone listening. Bind it up, rebuke it, command to leave. I bind up any deception in my mouth, any deception in my mind about what's about to be presented. I rebuke it, command it to leave me. I bind up any deception in the listener's mind about how things should be biblically speaking. I bind up all deception, all plants of uh, information from the demonic world that has planted so many traditions and societal norms that are outright lies and contrary to the word of god i bind that up from from myself and each and every listener i command it to leave each and every one of us in jesus's mighty name i and i just bind up any twisting of my words to by in the ears of the listeners by demons to to take this message off track or to take it in a direction it should not go and so, Father God, I just thank you and praise you for pouring your spirit out. Let no flesh speak, Father. Let your spirit speak the truth to us in love and in truth and righteousness. And uh, let it be iron sharpening iron, Father God. Sometimes when iron sharpens iron, there are sparks. And Father, if it creates any kind of division among us, let it be the division of the bone from the marrow. Let it be to get excuse me, let it get to, to be to get at the truth and the truth only so that those of us listening who want only the truth can receive it and be set free. I pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name and the saints said amen, amen, and amen. Well, you can imagine I talk with a lot of people through the ministry about the condition of their marriages and the condition of the spouse that they're dealing with. And I have to say, you know, I get I get uh, emails from women and men, and, and sometimes uh, there's a narcissistic man uh, that's involved, and sometimes there's a narcissistic woman, we'll call a Jezebel-spirited woman, involved. And before I, at the onset, I want to at least say this, that it cuts both ways. And I could do an entire message on men, which almost all the messages prior have been about both men and women. But this thing I really wanted to address as relates to women and feminism's impact on us as a body of believers and how it's upturned and usurped the biblical model. And I believe that's why many wives are miserable in their marriages and see their husbands as simps and cucks who they can bully or will do whatever they say and they don't respect their husbands and they sometimes stray outside of their own marriages because they don't feel like they're getting leadership. But a large part of it has been this twisting of the biblical reality set forth by God's word about how our marriages should be structured. And because we've gone outside of those uh, boundaries by a lot, uh, women, women aren't happy. And so I'm going to address this from the female perspective. I know I'm a man. I know many feminists might say I'm mansplaining. Well, I just, I, I'm sorry, I'm just a man. I'm going to address this anyway. I don't really care what anybody thinks about that because we're supposed to minister the whole of the word of God. And so I'm going to do so today. So 
I kind of want to start off by addressing the order of things in a typical hierarchy or, or organizational chart structure. If you think about it from that perspective, say from a military perspective, you've got all these people with different ranks. And if you just do it from the army perspective, the lowest guy is like a private, the top guys, a four or five star general. And, and during wartime, there could be a five star general. And there's all points in between, you know, corporal, sergeant, all the six different types of sergeants there are, staff sergeants, gunnery sergeant, master sergeant, all of these things. And then after that, you go to the um, officers, you start with lieutenant, second second lieutenant, lieutenant, you go to captain, and on onward to uh, major, colonel, uh, lieutenant colonel, then colonel, then general, and the types of different star generals, so... I might have left out a couple, but you get the basic gist of it. And in a organization such as a military one, the subordinate member is to obey the orders of the one above. So I want to show you from a biblical perspective how this is represented in Colossians 3.22. It says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. So the reason I brought this out is this is talking about in, in the workplace or any time that you have someone that is a boss over you, you are doing that work not as unto them, but as unto the Lord. You're obeying them. You're doing what you've been asked to do for the Lord. Actually going to listen and do what they want you to do as unto Him, serving Him. And uh, when you can get to that attitude, it is, it is so freeing when you realize that you have a jerk for a boss and you can uh, still do the best work possible, even though that person's mistreated you. I know I've kind of gone off the topic of men and women in a, in, a, in a relationship, but you'll see why I went this way and how I'm developing this idea. So I'll give you an example of when I worked in the business world. I was doing contract work, and I went to work for this power company in the IT department, and it was for a project. And I was asked to do some stuff that was computer-related and, and sort of building this database and whatnot. So... It, I was being called upon for some some skilled labor, but uh, my boss and I, he was religious. He was a religious man, but didn't really know the scriptures, and he was sort of like one of a, a Baptist guy that went to church a lot, but didn't really know the word. And so we would get in conversations about God, and I contradicted him one time, and he got very angry at me. And uh, as a result, the next day, he called me into his office and said, you know what, um, we, we really need the refrigerator to be stocked. We need all the drinks and the snacks stocked. You know, it was an IT department, and a lot of IT departments will have caffeinated drinks and whatnot to keep their programmers and, and project people going. And so he said, I, I'd like you to do that. It was a huge slap to, to the face. I mean, when he said that, I knew that he was he was tooling me. He was mad at me and he was going to put me in my place. And so I said to myself, I, I was really mad. I went home that night and I thought, I'm not doing that. I didn't get hired to stock refrigerators. And uh, then I prayed about it. Nope, do it as unto me. And I went back there. I ordered those drinks, had the drinks brought in. And I put them in that refrigerator as if you'd gone to a 7-Eleven. I had them all in order, like the different types of drinks and when you'd reach in for one uh, and, and one would be gone, I would go check and I would, I would pull them all forward or I would keep it restocked. It was always perfectly full with all the drinks and whatever other snacks that I was meant to buy in there. I did it to the best of my ability. And it wasn't very long before that shamed this man. He was really shamed. And he actually started giving me more... Uh, bigger responsibilities that were more related to what I was doing. It really shamed him. And so, and I didn't act mad at him. I didn't act angry. He'd go and see that refrigerator every day. And uh, that 
I, I say all this to say is sort of a bit of a premise for it doesn't matter what situation you're in. If you're in a hierarchy that's been established biblically that you were supposed to do something, you need to do it as unto the Lord. And even if you even if you've been mistreated or offended, and I'm going to show how and the biblical hierarchy of the relationship is Christ is the head of the man, man head of the woman, how there are times that men are wrong and they ask women to do things that they shouldn't do with one caveat. If you're being asked to sin, don't do that because then you're sinning against God. How can you do something as unto the Lord and sin against God? But I'm going to try to show women that you can have peace and have peace with God and still do some annoying things that you shouldn't necessarily have to do, even if you've been mistreated. And how God says that if you do that, it's going to perhaps uh, bring your your spouse closer to God and to show them by your behavior the way they should behave. So I'm going to get to that. I want to jump the gun on that too much. I want to kind of stay in, in this idea of, of hierarchy if you come with me to Hebrews 13, verse 17, it says, Obey them that have the rule over you, and it submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So here it is. There's the word obey and the word submit. That in situations where we have people that are over us, we obey and submit. So in my last job, I had an owner of the club and I had a director uh, that I worked with more with. I mean, he never treated me like I was a subordinate, but if he asked me to do something, either one, I did it. They asked me to do it. It was my job. I had to do it. I, and, and, and Jesus here is saying that I need to do that. So I don't think anybody has any problem with that unless you have a Jezebel narcissistic spirit that's defiant, wants to be in control. The Jezebel spirit has to be in control. It cannot take orders from anyone that's in the proper place in the hierarchy over them. Um, it, it'll it'll take it for a while, but it, it, it cuts them to the quick. Especially if that person is ordained of God to be um, over the the Jezebel narc. Now I kind of want to show you how Jesus Himself is in hierarchy with the Father. He said uh, He said in verse nineteen of of John uh, chapter five. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. So you have Jesus also admitting in John 14, verse 28, he says, Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, you would rejoice, because I said I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. So Jesus expressed throughout his ministry that he was here to do the will of the Father and whatever the Father commanded him, he did. And Jesus also said to us, if you love me, keep my commandments. And that's our expression of subordination to God, that we are, we are willing to do whatever he said. And also you'll remember that when Jesus was, was in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before he went to the cross, he said to the, to the Father, Father, take this cup away from me. He said, uh, but nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So there's this conscious act on Jesus' part to be subordinate and obedient to his Father. And we are to do the same to God the Father. But there are also uh, hierarchies, as I pointed out, in the earth where we're to be obedient to those people that are over us. So even though that man that was over me, his intent was evil and meant to... Uh, slap me down and put me in my place. It was a narcissistic move long before I knew what narcissism was. God's reaction in me to, to that he put in me, which was contrary to what I wanted to do. And that's going to be the kind of the theme of this, that I had to do something God led me to do that was contrary to what my flesh wanted to do. And when I did it, it, proved, it produced very good fruit. And I had a very long tenure at that, at that uh, particular place of business, which I really enjoyed working at, aside from this man who I later learned had a terrible reputation throughout the, uh, the company where I was. So, But still, do you see how God calls us to peace? He calls us to, uh, to be a servant. You know, he, he presented himself as a servant, Jesus did. And, and our job as people in this earth is to serve others. He said, the greatest among us would be the least and servant to all. And so 
And that's why Jesus washed all the feet of the disciples before he went to the cross to show them that how we should be unto others. So when we're in a position of subordination, we should rejoice in that because that means we're actually in the greater position. So how, I've already made the implication, well, not just the implication I quoted from the scripture that said Christ the head of the man, man the head of the woman. How did that happen? Was that the way it was from the start? I don't think so. I think in the garden, everything was just hunky-dory. There was no need to, to I, for either of them to command each other or to put each other in subordination because there was perfect peace in the garden. There was no, And there'll be perfect peace uh, in eternity. There will be no reason for us to be one over the other, I don't think. But uh, at any rate, I don't see that there was any real hierarchy in the garden. I mean, they only had one rule. Don't, don't partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So let's just go back to how man and woman were created well of course the man was created first and then it said and then the lord god said verse 18 of genesis chapter 2 it is not good that man should be alone i will make him and help meet for him and out of the ground the lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto adam to see what he would call them and whatsoever adam called every living creature that was the name thereof and adam gave names to all the cattle and to all the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field but for adam there is not found an help meet for him so here we have the role of the of the of the wife is going to be an help meet for him, where she helps him, and I'm sure he helps her, and they have this um, relationship uh, based on uh, reciprocity, giving and taking from each other. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman. And brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So you see here from the beginning, the woman was taken from man. You know, you think chicken or the egg. So women bear children, and all men come from the womb of a woman now. But in the beginning, it was not so. In the beginning, the woman came from the man, and she was brought into the world and helped meet for the man. So where did things go wrong? Well, of course, in the garden, the woman, uh, Eve, she was uh, deceived of the serpent and partook of the fruit and then gave it to her husband, who knowingly took it as well. So all three of them were cursed. The, the, the serpent, Satan, was cursed. The, the woman as well as the man. So here are the curses that came upon them, uh, upon the woman and the man. In chapter 3, verse 15, it says, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy, die, excuse me, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So here we have a bit of a changing of the guard, and that the woman would be ruled over by the man. Whereas before, like I said, I, I feel like it, there was a reciprocal relationship. They two were together. There was no reason for one to rule over the other. It was probably the equality that everybody thinks they're searching for, which modern day feminism as a form of uh, goddess worship basically has turned everything on its head. But we'll get to that. Don't want to jump the gun too much. And then you see from the curse for the man, it says unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened to the voice of, the, of thy wife, hast eaten of the tree of which I command thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. And the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So there's that curse upon man and so you notice that when the way that god phrased it was um and unto adam he said because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and as i see it in the church among men and women in this feminist society women men are hearkening to the voice of their wives to keep the peace because it's been so ingrained in women to wear the pants to take over as it's reflected in all forms of movies and media, you know, from all these sitcoms where the dads were doofy, brunt of the jokes uh, people. And, you know, you can really see this in this um, curse that came down uh, upon Israel in uh, the book of Isaiah, where 
it talks about, I'll go ahead and read it to you from Isaiah chapter three, uh, verse nine. It says, the shoe of their countenance doth witness against them and they declare their sin is Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. So here he's describing Israel as a society that has just like, they're bragging about their sin. They don't hide it. He's saying, woe unto them. Then he says, say to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. But woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. But then he says, as for my people, children are their oppressors and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. So here he's describing that the fruit of their wickedness is that children are oppress men as is happening now, as reflected in all the sitcoms and movies where the man is being tooled around by his children and um, a man can no longer uh, rule his own home. He can't uh, spank his own children. He can't correct anybody. The woman corrects the man. And uh, if the man tries to correct the children, she'll correct the man for correcting the children. Everything is completely on its head. And this is reflected in that, that here it's clear that God's saying that if a woman rules over a man, this is a negative outcome. This is not God's order of things. And so we see how it got turned it got turned over right from the start when Lucifer or Satan wanted to take God's throne. He wanted to take God's job, but as I've said so many times, he's not omnipotent, he's not omnipresent, he's not omniscient. So he had no, he had, he was not given the tools to be God. He can't be God. So in his pride, he thought that he could be God, but that's the essence of pride when you think you can do something that you're not equipped to do. So let's look at pride for a second. It says, um, at his pride, go to Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will send into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will send, ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So that's the that's going to be the fruit of his doing. Bef before uh, uh, the consequences of pride is destruction, as we'll read here. You know, John uh, in 1 John described three types, three basic categories for sin in the world. He said in uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So you see these three uh, basic categories of worldly sin, and pride is one of them, the pride of life. And that's that. the genesis of that was in Lucifer, or Satan, when he uh, originally sinned against God in his pride. So if we go into the Proverbs, we see some 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 things about pride. We see that uh, in Proverbs 16, 18, that pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We see in, in 11, 2, when pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. We see in uh, 13, 10, only by pride cometh, content, com, cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. So in a roundabout way, as I get to the scriptures about uh, man, men and women in a marriage, my contention here is that women that are, are that are in a, a so-called Christian relationship that are defying their husbands on purpose uh, and, and being disobedient and especially trying to usurp and undercut their position as, uh, quote, man of the house or as, quote, uh, the person at the top of the hierarchy in the house. Those women that do that, they're doing it because of pride. They're doing it because... They do not like the estate that they were born into, and that is that of being a woman. They do not want to be subordinate. And uh, you could see men act this way in organizations where they're supposed to be subordinate to another man, and they defy that, and uh, generally there's consequences for that. But in today's society with Satan, he, 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 his job is to turn everything on its head Women are being, um, at every turn, advised, counseled to take what's theirs, to 
um, what, what they think is theirs, to take something really that is not theirs, and that is the position of authority in the house. And I'm telling you that the basis of that is pride. And I'm going to show you why it's pride, because anything that goes against the Word of God is pride. But before I get to that, I want to show you just a couple other examples in the Word that shows uh, when the, uh, an order of hierarchy is wrong. So go with me uh, to Ecclesiastes 10, verse 5. It says, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, as an heir which proceeded from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low place. I have seen servants upon horses, and princes walking as servants upon the earth. So he's saying, King Solomon saying there, he's saying, Golly, I look out at, at, at society and I see that there are these, these men that should be of great estate and they're walking and I see these, these servants that, sh that, that, are, that, are, that are not of, of that estate on the horses. And I'll, that is so even now because I want to tell you that every Christian that truly loves God is a king and a priest. So go with me to Revelation 1, 5 through 8. It says, And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Jesus Christ is not the king of the princes that rule the nations. Those people that rule the nations in sin serve Satan. The kings he's talking about, that, that's us. And for the most part, we, we, we are in a very low estate in this, this earth because this kingdom is not our kingdom. You know, Jesus spoke about that his servants would fight if this were his kingdom. Well, this is, he called Satan the prince of this world three times in the book of John. We are not of this world. And so we are, as it were, walking the earth while these people uh, that are flying around in jets and whatnot are servants of Satan. And it's upside down. Do you see what I'm saying? So you look at all these Illuminati members that that have such great wealth, all these musicians like Beyonce and Katy Perry and Jay-Z and, and, and just a plethora, Lady Gaga and so on and so forth. All of these really multi-millionaire people in the sports world that are flashing Illuminati symbolism like LeBron James or... or uh, the guy out at Golden State that's supposed to be a Christian that's constantly flashing Illuminati symbols. Why do I always forget his name? He's from Charlotte, but anyway, don't really care what his name is. He's, he's, he's satanic. So all of these people that are Satan servants, they're up on the horse, basically. They're, they're, they're getting theirs now, whereas we're eating our broccoli now to get the dessert later. So, and, and believe me, that's the way you want to do it. It's the same way Jesus had to deal with Satan offering him all the kingdoms of the world. He was going to get them anyway. Jesus is going to rule and reign for a thousand years. And Satan is going to be cast into a bottomless pit for the whole time. So he's going to get what Satan offered him, but it's just, he just doesn't, uh, he didn't need to get it on Satan's terms. And I'm telling you women that in this present state of, of affairs, that you are giving in to Satan by taking a power and authority that is not yours now, I am pretty certain that in the future we're all going to be um, back equals again. I'm almost I'm almost certain of that. You know, like Jesus said that we'll neither marry nor give in marriage in, in the in the days to come, and that will be as the angels. You know, and so I'm sure you're not going to feel in eternity. Uh, any oppression from men or that you'll have to submit to anything that makes you you feel queasy. Everything's going to be perfect. But in this current state of affairs, what you've been presented and what you've been caused to embrace has actually gone against the Word of God and it's it's caused great division in the family. Now listen, I'm not trying to say men don't do their own part in all this. They do. Sin, sin is going to divide. And so many of you women are listening or are obeying your husbands and you're keeping the word and you're still being uh, abused because of that narcissistic spirit that's in them. Well, may you all be delivered, but may you continue to walk in the word no matter what and be obedient to Christ first and to his word so that you may be accounted worthy uh, for eternal life. Because defiance of his word, ladies, I'm telling you, defiance of your husband when it says here that you're not supposed to defy him it's uh, 
it, it, I believe it's going to reap a result that you won't enjoy and you won't like. You'll be in hell forever submitting to demons down there rather than uh, having obeyed the word of God. I mean, it, just doesn't, it doesn't matter what part of the word that's been presented to us. We have to obey it. So let's go ahead and go to the word, and then I'm going to talk more about um, feminism and how it's affected us. So if we go to Ephesians 5.22, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands. Submit. That means... Submission means that you're going to obey the direction of your husband as unto the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so the, the wives be to their own husbands. I mean, it's just super clear, super clear. And then you wonder, um, you wonder if, if, well, what if my husband's not o obeying Christ? I shouldn't have to obey anything he says. I can defy him. Well, that's not right either because two wrongs don't make a right. If we go over here to Peter, who has a, a second witness of this, he says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. So he's saying here that even to the unbelieving spouse, spouse, you should be obeying him. So that would be a witness unto him. Just like I obeyed that man to, I know this seems really trivial, but I obeyed that man to, to fill up that refrigerator with drinks when that wasn't why I was hired. I did it anyway, and it shamed him, and he changed his behavior. And that's what this scripture is teaching you, that, that to even obey them. Now, once again, I'm going to say, if he asks you to sin, if your husband says, hey, go rob that store, you don't go rob that store. But in the things that are within reason, within the word of God, your obedience to his request is going to allow you to uh, proceed. One thing I'm going to kind of diverge about that I've seen so many women be defiant about is when their husbands begin to go down a road of seeking the truth, and they start going into these corners of truth that the church in large part has avoided, such as the, the, the holiday, the so-called holidays, I call them holidays, Christmas being the, the chief example. A husband may find out the truth about Christmas, that it's uh, based on paganism, that the tree is actually forbidden by Jeremiah 10, verse 2 through 6, where it speaks of bringing in an evergreen tree and decking it with silver and gold. This has been going on. Uh, for millennia, ever since the days of Nim King Nimrod, who's mentioned in Babylon, uh, excuse me, mentioned in the book of Genesis, and it's an idol. It's it's spoken of as an idol. It's something the heathen do. He studies it in depth. He decides he doesn't want to do it anymore, and that is, as for him and his house, they shouldn't do it. Well, the wife becomes, the wife in this case being in idolatry, holds on tight to it and leaves him because of it, or takes the kids because of it. This is a great evil because even if he wasn't right, it's saying here in First Peter, you should obey your husband anyway. Even if that was really to the glory of God, you should be willing to set aside something that clearly isn't to the, uh, uh, to the glory of God. In this spiritual matter, the taking away of something is not hurting you. It's not causing you to sin. If you don't celebrate Christmas, you're not sinning especially if you don't bring Santa into your house. So in this situation, I've seen, and I've talked with many men, or multiple men, I'll say, that have called me and told me the fruit of them trying to go holy on Christmas. And they know what their women are going to do. And these are women that were brought up either in the Baptist church or in, in some side of the church where Christmas was just so uh, uh, grilled into them that it is just, they worship it. And it's demonic. It so reminds me of the book of Jeremiah, where Jeremiah was telling the people to stop worshiping the queen of heaven. But the women responded to him, no, we will not stop. For ever since we left off worshiping her, things have gone wrong for us. And they just held on worshiping the, the queen of heaven, which was idolatry. And so a woman that takes her children and runs because she's, she wants to honor Christmas and defiance to her husband who's actually sincerely seeking God about the truth, that's evil. That's wicked. That, that can put you in hell if you ask me. So, I mean, 
I'm telling you, women, you really need to, if your husband's really studying and really seeking things out in the scriptures, you really need to let him go down that road and you need to be obedient to what he's saying because he may know something you don't and he's trying to protect you and his family. And this kind of defiance and disobedience uh, to the priesthood and the, and the, of the family that the man should be, I'm telling you, you that that's not going to go without punishment. That's not going to go without punishment. You know, I'm reminded of Rachel. When Rachel, uh, when they left Laban, Rachel's father, they being Jacob, his two wives and and their two maidens, uh, they left Laban. And when they when they left, Rachel actually stole her father's idols, and she took them with her, and. When, when Laban returned home and he saw that his, his idols had been stolen, he chased after them. And when he caught up to them, Laban was really mad and he searched for the idols, but he couldn't find them because Rachel had put them under her own furniture and said that she was having her period basically and she was sitting up on it and couldn't get up. She said uh, in verse 35 of Genesis 31, Let it not displease my Lord that I cannot rise up before thee, for the custom of women is upon me. And he searched, but found not the images. And one thing that Jacob had said at the beginning, he said, um, Jacob, when he's being accused of stealing his gods, Jacob answered and said to Laban, He said, With whomsoever thou findest thy gods, let him not live. Before our brethren discern thou what is, with th- what is thine with me, and take it to thee. For Jacob knew not that Rachel had stolen them. So Jacob had basically put down a death sentence for her in that sense because he was the head of the family. And she didn't die then. But you know, it wasn't many years later when Benjamin was being born that um, Rachel actually died having Benjamin. So if you come with me to Genesis 35, 16, it says, And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, and Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set a pillar upon her grave that is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. Jacob loved her to death, literally. I mean, he waited so long for her. If you go back and read the story, basically, of Jacob's trouble and how Laban tricked him and gave him Leah first, and he loved her, but she was not seeking after his God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and she stole the gods of her own father. And so I'm telling you that with regard to Christmas and Easter, a lot of you women are married to prophets. You're married to people that are going to find the truth or finding the truth about these matters way ahead of anybody that you've ever known. And obviously the community of people that are believing the truth has grown leaps and bounds since in the last 20 plus years that I've been a Christian. I mean, it's it's grown a lot uh, because of, of right now we have the ability to uh, expand the truth on the internet for as long as it's allowed and people are finding the truth. And if you're uh, calling your husband crazy and names because he's wanting to purify himself before God, check out this scripture in First Timothy. Paul's writing, he says, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So here we have this idea that We've got this man in the relationship that's saying that Christmas is idolatry. Obviously, in our last example, Jacob knew not to steal Laban's idols, and yet Rachel, being deceived, did so. And we have these women in these relationships with these men that know that Christmas is idolatry, among other things that that God's been showing them, and yet they can't receive it, and they're ridiculing their husbands. If we continue in that scripture, it says, Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. So it even mentions, excuse me, being saved in childbearing, in the which Rachel herself was not saved in childbearing. She died. And so the point I'm trying to make is, if your husband's going off into righteousness and you can't understand it, and you don't understand what's happening, you need to check yourself, not ridicule him, and figure out, 
why is he doing this? What is it about, uh, about this situation that he's, he's pursuing this route and do not try to, uh, correct your man when you're supposed to be in, uh, not to teach him, nor to usurp authority over him, but to be in silence. So look, I'm sure that Paul's not saying that you need to be in total silence. You can contribute, um, your own thoughts, but in the end, it's up to your husband to determine the direction of your family and whether or not you're going to uh, worship Christmas idols or not, you know, and that's just in this example, but there's lots of other examples. You know, right now I'm not talking about the husband that says he believes and, and goes out and does unscrupulous business practices, uh, steals, uh, uh, lies, cheats. I'm not talking about him. I'm not talking about this guy. I'm talking about the guy that's really seeking the Lord for purity and you are being used of the enemy to punish him and to create vitriol in your family. And that's just got to stop this disobedience, this defiance, this you having to wear the pants in the family. And of course, you know, we've talked in other videos, this has been going on for years and years and feminism has convinced women that they don't need man, men. You know, Irina Dunn said, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. And it's, that's, that is a ridiculous, man-hating, misandry statement. Misandry is the hatred of males. Misogyny is a hatred, dislike, or mistrust of women. And that's one thing that these, these societal moves are meant to do. I've done videos on divide and conquer. They're supposed to create misandry and misogyny. And, and that's the whole point of it. And... They're, they're meant also to make women hate any patriarchal form of society. And what's a patriarchy? It's a form of social organization, which the father is the supreme authority in the family, clan or tribe. And such it was and such it is, as we've seen in the scriptures, that Christ, the head of the man, man, head of the woman. That's a patriarchal setup. Now, the men, well, what about the men? What are they supposed to do? They're supposed to love their wives. I mean, the scripture is very clear on a man loving his wife as, as he loves his own self and to treat his wife, you know, as his own flesh. And if a man's doing that properly, he's not going to mistreat you, but he is going to hold his ground uh, on things like Christmas, Easter, Sunday, Sabbath. He's going to hold his ground on, on deliverance and the things that he's learning about uh, in the church. And rightly so. And if you are truly serving God as a Christian woman, you would go along with him on that. You would take that journey with him and not laugh at him to scorn, laugh him to scorn because he's doing that. Look here in, in uh, 1 Peter th verse 3, excuse me, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Likewise, ye husbands dwell with them, your wives, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of this life that your prayers not be hindered. So here we have weaker vessel, and one of feminism's big push is that of equality. But here the Bible calls the woman the weaker vessel. Well, which is it? Are men and women equal, or, or, is the, or is the woman weaker? Well, most of us have lived long enough in this world to know that women are weaker, especially in the physical sense. I mean, it's, it's quite obvious as a sports instructor of many years. I mean, it just it is what it is. It can't be denied, and most women wouldn't deny it. And to say it's any other way is, is just a lie. It's just an outright lie. So, and I'm not trying to humiliate women in so saying, but it's just the state of affairs. You were born as women into a state of affairs that causes you to be subordinate to men, both in, in the home and in the church. And that's the, that's the way it is. And, and just like I had to suck up and be humble and stock that fridge. And I know I keep going back to this silly little example, but it taught me a lot about being obedient, even when the person over me wasn't even right. And so we have to find a way in these relationships to get back in the proper order or they're not going to work. There cannot be two people driving a family and there cannot be one person driving the family if it's a woman because it's upside down. And if you're really honest with yourself, if you're one of those women that's wearing the pants, you don't like it and you don't respect your husband, you probably find yourself degrading him and, and talking down to him and not treating him as a man. And because you have taken uh, over an improper position and it's causing you to do evil, it's causing you to do evil. And 
a lot of times the men that you're with, they're Ahabs, and they're enabling you to do that. And that's evil too. The man's got to stand up for himself and for his position and not take it and let there be consequences. Even if that means the woman's going to leave or, and, and go, go her own way. But they're, they're so using feminism as a divide and conquer methodology that there's groups of people that call themselves MGTOW now, men going their own way. It's in the Urban Dictionary, it says a statement of self-ownership where the modern man preserves and protects his own sovereignty above all else. So in essence, he's saying he's not going to marry. If he's with women, it's only to use them for sex. And he's just not going to give in and let a woman, a woman rule him. And it's so hard these days for men to find women who don't want to rule them because of feminism. Deep down, a man doesn't want to be ruled. And once he figures that out what's happened and how the feminist uh, ideology has turned everything on its head, he, he's just going to walk away. And that's why a lot of women are not married or they don't have men because of the fact that these men have walked away. So there was an article about Jennifer Aniston. She said, women don't need men to be able to start a family. And it's encouraging women that are single to go have children. Well, have you seen the fatherless statistics? Do, do we really not need each other? Do men not need women? Do women not need men? Look at the uh, facts about the fatherless. In the United States, 23.9 million children live absent of their biological fathers. Fatherless children represent 63% of teen suicides, 70% of juveniles in state institutions, 71% of high school dropouts, 75% of children in chemical abuse centers, 80% of rapists, 85% of youths in prison, 90% of homeless and runaway children. And they don't need their fathers? Come on. Come on, guys. This isn't right. It's not right. Children need their father. Fathers. They need their father. But this feminist created such a hatred. You know, if women if women don't need men, look at this employment employment by gender uh survey from two thousand and two thousand ten. So I'm just gonna do three three uh categories where men just so dominate uh these categories. Installation, maintenance and repair, construction and extraction, farming, fishing, and forestry. You can see that those categories are pretty much predominantly 99% orange. And look how that's in the year 2000. Look how in 2010, those three didn't change. So more women are working than ever, but they're not doing jobs that involve, I mean, anything that requires um, hard manual labor. They're not, uh, they're not trash people. They're not doing these hard jobs. They're not getting down in sewers. They're not like working, uh, doing electrical work. They're not doing plumbing for the most part. I know there's some women that do, but predominantly it's men. Uh, you know, a woman wakes up and starts her day, goes in the bathroom, turns on the faucet, a man installed. She dry, she goes downstairs and uh, turns on a dishwasher, uh, a man installed. She goes out to her car built by men, some women. Yes, there's some women in manufacturing, true, mostly men designed by men because it's mostly men that are still doing uh, engineering jobs and stem stem jobs uh, on roads built by men uh, to jobs with office buildings built by men so i'm I, i'm i'm just trying to to point out that the denigration of men to make them feel like they're worthless when they're doing a lot is a lie and Men should be honored for their part in society, just as women should be honored. Men do not need to be denigrated in order for women to be honored more or to be given a, a better position in life. And, uh, but that's the point of feminism. It's not really to give equality to women. It's to create division among us, to divide and conquer us, to destroy families. Now, take a look at this video uh, was recorded, um, this interview in which this man uh, claims to have spoken with one of the Rockefellers who told him that why feminism was really started. Take a gander. Well, one of the things they told me was that um, he, well, we were, he was at the house one night and uh, we, were talk, we were talking and he started laughing. He said, Aaron, what do you think women's liberation was about? And uh, I said, I, I had pretty conventional thinking about it at that point. I said, I think it's about women having the right to work, getting equal pay with men, just like they won the right to vote, you know? And he started to laugh, he said, you're an idiot. 
And I said, why am I an idiot? He said, you want, let me tell you what that was about. We, the Rockefellers, funded that. We funded Women's Lib, you know? And we're the ones who got all over the newspapers and television, the Rockefeller Foundation. He says, and you want to know why? He says, there were two primary reasons. And they were, one reason was, we couldn't tax half the population before Women's Lib. And the second reason was, now we get the kids in school at an early age. We can indoctrinate the kids how to think. So it breaks up the family. The, the kids start looking at the state as the family, as the school, as the officials, as their family, not as the parents teaching them. And so those are the two prim the primary reasons for women's live, which, which I thought up to that point was a noble thing. You know, when I saw their intentions behind it, where they were coming from when they created it, the thought of it, I saw, I saw the evil behind what I thought was a noble adventure. So you see, there was a multi-pronged approach. They wanted to break up the family, get children in, into schools at an earlier age, uh, into their indoctrination centers, uh, to get uh, both uh, a whole half of society paying taxes, and to destroy families. That's why they started feminism. It wasn't really for equality anyway. And you can see here by these uh, these particular job categories not changing that women don't really want to do the jobs uh, for which men men are doing. We're different. We do different things. And so you don't need to come home and denigrate your husband uh, after he's working all day and uh, make him feel feel bad for as if he had done nothing when he had actually done something. You know, I mean, I, I get testimonies of men that, you know, they come home and their women's just look just, and these are Christian women. They, one guy testified to me that he, he worked really hard up to sales to the highest ever. And he got home and she goes, well, it was about time. We, we should have been there all along. And so he could not win just, I forgive the expression, damned if he if he does, damn if he doesn't. It's just evil. It's so evil. And there's no honor in the home for the men anymore because society has just denigrated men. And it's wrong. It's really wrong. It's really wrong. And then look at this, this fact sheet about men. The biggest killer of men under 50 is suicide. 35% of men are more likely to die from cancer. 59% of the prison population are fathers. 3.8 million children live in fatherless homes. I think it's more than that. Two and three murder victims are male. I mean, there's all these things that men are suffering that, that just go unaccalled for. 84% of all homeless people are men. Men, men are being mistreated. There's a movie put out by this lady named Cassie J called Red Pill. She started a feminist. She ended not one because she saw the divide and conquer aspect of it. She's not disacknowledging problems uh, and inequalities for women. She's, she, she was a feminist. She did that for the whole sum of her life until she did all this research. Women, if you're really a Christian woman, you should be honoring your husband. You should be building him up. You should be making him a better person. If he's going deeper into the word than you, you should be saying, wow, I'm proud of my husband. But I'm telling you, those that are that that are staying in the way of your husband doing that, that's evil, man. That's straight from the pit, and that's a, that's a demon in you. You need deliverance. It's a Jezebel spirit. And, you know, I've get, been getting a lot of calls from people that are really on the right track with God that are men, and their women are fighting them tooth and nail, and they're supposed to be Christians. They're coming up with list. One uh, I've spoken to, his wife has left him with his kids, and she's writing up a list of demands for him. And I'm sure they have to do with Christmas and going to the, the church of her choosing, which is a church that has idolatry all in it. I mean, I mean, are you hearing that? You know, it's against the scripture for the woman to come up with a list of demands for her husband as if she's going to control the narrative and direct the family. The man is supposed to come up with a vision for the family and lead his family in it, not the woman. That's demonic. That's satanic. That's what Satan try, has tried to do with God, and that's what this wife is doing with her husband. And it's really quite evil. You know, I'm reminded of a... Uh, I hope you guys aren't hearing this, but there's a, there's a weed eater outside, and it's a man doing the weed eating, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. Please, please, my women listeners, don't be offended. I'm just, 
I'm really tired of seeing men just thrown just under the bus. I'm just tired of it. I mean, I guess I am one, you know, and it was the complete defiance of God's word that's led to it for, for many, many men that are trying to do right by God. They're being punished for it. Just as many of you women listening have been punished and are being punished for having done right by God. Your husbands are, you know, looking down their nose at you and mistreating you because of it. I'd like you to see this um, story that in the book of Esther that many of you might remember. The, the, the story starts with King Ahasuerus and he is over all the land from India, even all the way to Ethiopia. So in those days, he, uh, he, he started, he had a feast. I'm going to go and read it. He, this is verse three. In the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him. When he shewed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even 104 score days. And when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. So let's take it up to verse 9. And Vashti the, the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehumem, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, and and Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, to the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal, to shew the people and the princess her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned within him. So here we have defiance. She disobeyed the, the request of her husband. Then the king said to the wise men, which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment, which saw the king's face and which sat at the first of the king in the kingdom. What shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to the law, because she hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains? And Memukim answered before the king and, and the princes, Vashti the queen hath, done, hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of, of the king Assyrius. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so they shall despise their husbands in their eyes. When it shall be reported, the king Assyrius commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes, which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. If they please the king, let there go a royal commandment be from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it, not be, alter, that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before the king Assyrtius, and let the king give a royal estate unto another that is better than she. So I know this wasn't a, a Christian or a, even a Jewish kingdom, but the point is well taken that they knew that if the king queen could get away with what she just did and defying the king, that all women would defy their husbands. And as it were, that such was the state of that society, it was patriarchal, they had to make sure to put a stop to that. And such is the case in the Christian home. The man is head of the woman. And if she defies him, she's showing great um, contempt for her husband. And it's a sign of hatred. You know, Jesus told us if we loved him, we would obey him. And it's the same for you wives. If you want to show honor to your husband, obey his requests that are reasonable, that are within the word of God. If he's not asking you to sin and it's not too much of a burden in the sense that he's not trying to make you into some kind of slave. I'm not, I'm not saying that you need to become that. But you know what? There are times when your husband isn't right. There are times when you're actually right and he's wrong, but he's holding steadfast in what he wants to do or what he believes he's feeling led to do. What do you do during those times? You go to God in prayer. You don't exhibit defiance and disobedience and stubborn self-will against your husband during that time, you go straight to your prayer closet and pray that God would intervene and God will intervene. I'm reminded of Sarah and Abraham when Sarah wanted Ishmael and his mother Hagar gone. So let's go ahead and look at that. Hagar was Sarah's 
uh, handmaiden that she had taken out of Egypt. And when Sarah could not have a child with Abraham, she gave Hagar to Abraham and they had a child named Ishmael. And as it turns out, Ishmael was one day teasing Isaac, who uh, Sarah finally had a son herself at the age of 90 named Isaac. And when, I'll just go ahead and read it to you from Genesis 21, 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad, and because of, the, of thy bondwoman. And all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for an Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also of the son of the bondwoman will I make him nation, because he is thy seed. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, took bread and a bottle of water, gave it to Hagar, unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, and the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered to the wilderness of Beersheba. So the reason why I mentioned this is because he was right. I mean, excuse me, she was right. Sarah was right. And there will be times where God will correct your husband, but you have to give God a chance to do that. And you need to go to God with prayer and say, God, please move on my husband to to do this thing that you feel that God's leading him to do, but he's not seeing it. That's a time to you you, you say what you, you think should happen to your husband. You have every right to counsel him and advise him and to say what you think should happen. And then after that, you can um, trust God, trust him, trust him to deal with your husband. Uh, I know in a past relationship I had that God did that to me. You know, she was really pushing me to do something. I just did not feel led. I thought it was wrong. And then I prayed and then God led me to do it. And uh, so I've seen it happen in my own life. And I know that this can happen for you. So that's why you've got to trust as as the wife, you've got to trust more in your God and God, your father than in your husband. You have to put matters in his hand and know that he can direct your husband and direct your situation. So, um, give that, give that a go. Try that every time. Just go into prayer about it. Say your piece. And if he disagrees, let him do his thing and then go to God in prayer and trust him. It's all about trusting God and putting your faith in him. Now I'd like to address some situations I've heard where wives aren't really performing their wifely duties. Let's say you're, you, you're a stay at home mom and you have homeschool and your husband has worked all day. He's the only one making money and he comes home and you haven't made a meal for him and you leave every night, leave him with five kids to look after. And he's, he's not getting any reward for his labors and you're not helping him at all. It's evil. It's evil. It's evil. It truly is evil. And, you know, other things I hear about, of course, is women uh, in this situation, and men do this too, so let's, let's uh, not say they don't, uh, silent treatment or denying sex. You know, the word is really clear on sex, that you're not to defraud one another unless it's for a time of prayer and fasting, that you not be tempted. So that's scripture. You're not supposed to defraud your, your spouse. Uh, sex. Otherwise, he's going to be tempted to, to go fornicate with someone else. And you're not supposed to use it as a weapon. The Bible is very clear that, that your body is not your own. That the, your body, the wife's body is not her, is not her is, is, the wife's body is as much her husband's as the husband's body is the wife's. And sure, you may get sick. You may have a legitimate headache from time to time. All that's understandable. But using it as a weapon, that is not of God. That is not of God. Look here in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. It says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that you should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So here it is. You know, I, I hear so many testimonies of men and women, but women just berating their husbands. I mean, I've heard of them yelling at them like they're not cleaning out the sink correctly or 
they're they're not you know these little like super minor things that is like a diversion diversion tactic to lay into their husbands when they can't admit their own wrongdoing ladies i'm speaking to you in love it's time to get it right if if you're in defiance to your husband as the man of the house it's not going to go well with you it's really not going to go well with you it's not it's not right for you to do that you need to do whatever you can to make it right and that's my prayer for you that that you can learn to obe- be obedient to your husband as long as he's not asking you to sin and actually honor him and as a tangent you know i mentioned earlier that 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 curse from isaiah where it says that their children shall be their oppressors if you're enabling your children to defy an order of the father that is pure evil if you are getting them to obey you and to defy the father and to usurp the pot the father's authority with his children that is evil and I'm going to tell you, if you're doing both of those things, if you're defying your husband and causing the children to defy him because of this feminist spirit that's overtaken you and this Jezebel spirit that's overtaken you, you're going to find yourself busting hell wide open. You're not going to inherit heaven. You are walking in a state of evil. And if you are railing on your husband, you know, I'm reminded of this clip right here. I'm going to pull this from this movie called Dolores Claiborne where Dolores was being legitimately abused. Her husband was beating her and having sex with their daughter. And uh, of course, it's disgusting. It's fiction, though. I'm not saying that never happens, but they love to use fiction to create animosity, fictional tales that show men or women as being super evil, so that, especially men, that show men as being super evil so that when the woman does something back, in this case, Dolores uh, caused her husband to fall into a, a well and die, um, then, you know, as, as the watcher, you feel like, oh, well, he deserved that. And <laughs> it's hard not to, to say that he did, but it's, it's, it's a manipulation of the mind in this case of women to believe what this lady's about to say. Listen in. Sometimes, Dolores, sometimes you have to be a high riding bitch to survive. Sometimes... Being a bitch is all a woman has to hang on to. Sometimes all you have to have is to be a bitch. And I'm telling you, there are so many women that call themselves Christian that believe that that's all they've got and that's all that they should do. And I'm telling you, that is a great evil. Because as we just read in 1 Peter, we're really looking to, to not bitch out our, our spouses we're not supposed to be yelling at them. We're not supposed to be uh, dishonoring them and, and disrespecting them. Look at this in First Peter uh, 3, verses, verse 5. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. So Peter's saying here, Afraid with any amazement, my view is, are you afraid you're going to be abused and beaten? And if that's the case, you need to seek shelter. Get away from that man. He's a narc. He's evil. He's possessed. A man that's beating you on the daily uh, is, is, is not right. But I have to say, I've seen a lot of women in my ministry purposely try to, that of Jezebels, purposely try to instigate their men to hit them because they know they're not gonna. And if they do get them to hit them, then they're going to have something against them in court. They're actually purposely trying to instigate them. So men that are listening to this, be careful about that. Be careful because they will use it against you if their main aim is to to get you into court and to uh, usurp um, and to and to usurp your position and to get your children to take them from you. But anyway, back to the main point of this is that even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, that's honor. That's honor. And sometimes you have to obey people that are above you to do things you don't really want to do. But you don't do it unto yourself as it began with you do it as unto the Lord. (sighs) Women, I know it's hard. I'm not a woman. I mean, I'm a a man. I know. And so everyone's saying that that white men have have all the uh, 
we have no place to say or criticize or to, to say anything against anyone because we are we're privileged right well as i showed you on that one chart we're privileged to die of suicide we're privileged to die in wars uh, which women don't have to die and we're privileged to be on the titanic and to die while all the women get on the boat i mean a lot of men would trade that privilege i'm just saying but at the same time there are uh, i guess you would say perceived benefits to being a man but women, you're not going to ever be happy being a man because it's not your role. And that's why you're miserable. You that are trying to wear the pants, you're miserable and you're bitchy. Sorry to use that word. And you're angry and you're unhappy and you don't respect your husband and your eyes wander to, you know, tough guys and bad boys because they wouldn't put up with your garbage. Bad boys don't care about what you think. And that's why you like them. If you're, if you're a Christian woman listening and, and you find yourself attracted to men outside of your marriage that are bad boys and tough guys and thugs, you're attracted to them because they don't give a crud about what you think. And so in a way, that's more in line with, with the way things are because of the curse. Your desire is toward them, but they don't really much care about what you think. And maybe that's some counsel to men. Men, you have to stop enabling this stuff and don't care if she leaves you. Some of you men are so caught up in uh, maintaining your marriage or keeping your wife under your roof when she's just been murderously disrespectful of you that uh, and you're just willing to take anything. It's only serving to cause her to disrespect you more and, and probably go elsewhere and to seek those thug guys. I mean, I've seen it time and time again. Now listen, if you're a good Christian woman, I'm not putting this on you, but you must admit from your own observation, you've seen everything I've said. And so our objective as Christians is to not f conform to the world and what the world says and what society says we should be, but to conform to these scriptures that I've just read to you. You're supposed to honor your husband. Go with me here to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. It says, let your women keep silence in the churches for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. I mean, honestly, that's deep. A shame for women to speak in the church. That is really deep. And it seems so abusive probably to many women that are listening. But the thing I really want to take from that is that women aren't supposed to, to lead men. It's out of order. And that's why women that do lead men, and especially in the home, they're not content. They're not in their role. They've taken on a job, just like Satan tried to take from God, that they're not equipped to do. And when they get in that role, it's too much pressure. It's too hard. It's not right. Some of you women are raising your children alone because your husband was an alcoholic or a drug addict, and he gave up his a position of authority by doing what he's done. And that's wrong. And I pray that God would be, he's father to the fatherless and husband to the widow in that case, because you've been made like a widow and let him stand in the gap and may your children not fall into any of those statistics that I've read from today. You know, that's different. But the woman that comes home and disrespects her husband when it says here, and if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. Paul is saying, ask your husband about these spiritual matters. It's... You know, so many women go back to their own churches and they'll get these pastors to agree with them because the pastors are Ahabs and cucks and simps that have totally fallen into line with society. And they get their wives to disobey their husbands. They're, they're enabling this Jezebel spirit to operate in, 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 in homes. And I'm telling you right now, if, if there's any man that sides with a woman that's a pastor in terms of... Uh, of defiance of the husband's wishes for the home, that pastor is of the devil and that's evil. And he's right in line with that Jezebel spirit. And he's a cuck. He's a eunuch for Jezebel and he's doing her bidding. So I've read too many scriptures to you just now to prove out what I'm saying, that the woman is supposed to obey the believing and the unbelieving, unless you're suffering with any amazement. Wow, this has been a long one. I laid it down. I have a lot of female subscribers. I mean, like 60 to 65%. I may lose some of you, and I'm sorry if I do, but I had to speak the truth about this because 
this is a big reason why there's so much trouble in the church and there's so much trouble in the home. And I'm telling you women, if you don't want to be miserable anymore, try it. Try it for 30 to 60 days. Try obeying your husband, doing what he wants, as long as he's not asking you to sin. Try letting him lead. Try letting him make a decision that you feel in your, sp- in your spirit or your heart or probably in your mind, really. It's not in your spirit to defy your husband, um, but it's in your, it's in your own uh, training. Anytime you feel led to defy him and try to embarrass him in front of the children, try not. Try telling your children that to, to obey their father. Try obeying, your, obeying him yourself. And you see if peace doesn't come back to that home and see if your husband doesn't start treating you the way, the way you think, like a queen. You see if that everything, as long as he's a Christian man, see if it doesn't turn things on, on its head. Also, if he's an unbeliever, see if he doesn't start to, uh, to treat you better. See if he doesn't start to feel shame and guilt for his own behavior. That's what it says to do in the scripture. See if you can make all that work. Now is the time. I don't want any women to go to hell because they defied God by defying their husband. It's his word that says we're supposed to obey uh, those people in hierarchy over us. Christ, the head of the man, man, head of the woman. Please, ladies, I'm I'm, I'm begging you, get this part right, and I believe that you're going to have a much closer walk with the Lord. So let's go ahead and finish with prayer. Father God, I praise you and thank you for this this message. I pray that as many as could hear it will receive it and receive from your word the truth and walk in truth and right the wrongs that are in their families, both men and women, Lord. I'm asking you to deal with us and to help us make this this right and bring peace to our families and, and cause as many as can be within our families to turn unto you and to walk with you 100% whereby we can have fellowship one with another and, and be ministers not only to each other, but to be ministers to 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 the world, to, to draw your people out of darkness and into your great light. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said amen and amen and amen. So glad you listened and Have a great day, and I will talk to you soon. When my father and mother forsake me, the Lord shall raise me up. When in the synagogue they hate me, the Lord shall raise me up, and He'll lead me beside still waters, and He'll lead me in the power of His love, and I will find my way to Him. is like a friend in the arms of his love oh his love in the arms of his love oh his love in the arms of his love in the arms of his love When my wife and brother, they hate me, the Lord shall raise me up. When in church they scourge and berate me, the Lord shall raise me up, and he'll lead me besides to waters. Like a friend in the arms of his love Oh, his love In the arms of his love Oh, his love In the arms of his love In the arms of his love
of his love.